Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Center for Disaster Philanthropy webinar, Mobile Homes and Disaster, Understanding Risks and Opportunities. My name is John Cooper, Jr., and I am an Assistant Vice President in the Division of Academic and Strategic Collaborations at Texas A&M University and College Station, Texas. Uh, I'm also a member of CDB's Advisory Council and a Professor of the Practice in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning at Texas A&M, where my research and practice has focused on participatory planning, particularly as it relates to increasing the extent to which communities can prepare for, survive, and recover from disasters. Uh, one more thing about me, my, my connection to our topic today is professional, of course, dating back to the mid-90s when I worked uh, on housing recovery with the Division of Emergency Management in North Carolina, and we had to weigh the pros and cons of mobile homes as an option for replacement housing under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Uh, the topic is also personal for me. I grew up in rural East Texas uh, and spent the first five years of my life living in a mobile home in a time when the standards for mobile home construction weren't uh, uniform. And mobile homes are commonplace among the people and places I serve today. So I'm aware of the issues surrounding mobile homes and disasters, and I look forward to the discussion today. Next slide. Uh, just some uh, reminders before we get started. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer those questions at the end of the panel presentation. If you are on Twitter, please use hashtag CDP4Recovery, that's CDP, the number four, recovery, to share and join in on this discussion. And don't forget to follow us on at funds for disaster, the number four, at funds for disaster. At the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please take time to complete this survey as we use the feedback to help us improve our webinar offerings to better meet your needs. And finally, we are recording this webinar. It will be available on our, on our website and YouTube channel shortly after the webinar wraps. Live captioning is also available now via Zoom. Click on the closed, closed caption live transcript uh, button. I think that's at the bottom of your screen to access it. And uh, more accurate captions will be available in the recording after the fact. Next slide. This webinar is co-sponsored by the Minnesota Council on Foundations, Philanthropy New York, the Funders Network, and the United Philanthropy Forum. We thank them all for their support. Next slide. As we begin the webinar, CEP acknowledges that we are working from the stolen lands of many original peoples. We recognize indigenous peoples have been displaced and disenfranchised from their land by natural and human induced disasters, but also the socioeconomic and cultural disasters stemming from the vestiges of colonialism. We acknowledge when the US was founded, there were exclusions and erasures of indigenous knowledge about how to appropriately care for these lands, which led to environmental destru destruction and degradation and ultimately has had a significant impact on disaster risk in those same communities. That's uh, insult on top of exacerbated injury, if you think about it. Nevertheless, we are committed to dismantling the ongoing legacy systems and structures of settler colonialism and white supremacy. We commit ourselves to understanding where and how wealth accumulation has harmed people and the earth itself, and the complexities of philanthropy as connected to that truth. Uh, despite centuries of theft, violence, and murder, this is still and always will be indigenous land. Please join us in acknowledging the original people and their elders, past and present, as well as future generations. Next slide. Uh, just a quick note about the goals. At the end of the webinar, funders will have an increased understanding of the risks mobile homes residents face. You'll hear about and identify ways to support recovery and reduce risk in communities with mobile homes. And you will learn about promising practices and the importance of community engagement. Next slide. So uh, just what, what are mobile homes and manufactured homes? First, first let's, let's go over what's meant by that. And uh, hopefully that'll set the stage uh, with terminology that will inform the rest of the conversation. Uh, first off, mobile homes are defined as factory built before June 15, 1976, before laws regulating uh, safety standards were in place. Um, and manufactured uh, houses are built after June 15, 1976. Uh, today, lenders avoid lending for what by definition are mobile homes, which are those built before 1976. And maybe one of our speakers will say more about this, these classifications uh, before we wrap up for now. In this webinar, you may hear our panelists refer to mobile or manufactured housing. And for the purposes of this discussion, we consider those interchangeable terms. 
It is also important to note that with, uh, with mobile or manufactured homes, often residents only own the structure they live in, not the land it sits on. So in addition to paying for their home, they're also paying rent for the land. Okay, next slide. In the United States, more than 22 million people live in mobile and manufactured homes, which are important affordable housing options for many communities. According to data from the U.S. Census Bureau Survey of, Survey of Construction and its Manufactured Housing Survey, in 2021, the average cost per square foot for manufactured homes was half the price of their site-built counterparts on average. Uh, however, there is a, a stigma linked to manufactured housing that is reinforced by popular culture. For example, researchers conclude that misinformed stereotypes blind scholars and policymakers to the possibility that mobile or manufactured homes can help address the affordable housing crisis. And we believe philanthropy is also susceptible to these stereotypes and a shift in mindset is needed. Um, one persistent stereotype is that manufactured homes are poorly built. In re reality, manufactured homes built after 1976 when standards were imposed have been improved, improving in design materials and standards. And response to disasters in the, in the late 80s and early 90s in 1994, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, updated construction codes to improve the disaster resiliency of homes. Subsequently, assessments of homes affected by Hurricane Charlie in 2004 found that manufactured homes built in the, to the 1994 standards performed significantly better than homes built before 1994. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, sorry. Unfortunately, manufactured homes have higher exposure to natural hazards than other types of housing. Additionally, manufactured homes are often overlooked in hazards planning and in disaster recovery efforts. I should note, not by housing scholars at Texas A&M for the record, but I, but I won't address. Uh, sadly though, we have seen this play out again with the recent devastation caused by Hurricane Ian. Damage assessments are still underway. However, Ian likely damaged thousands of manufactured homes in Florida alone. According to the Florida Department of Health's county level mobile homes park listing, there are more than 2,200 mobile home parks with over 240,000 lots located in the 20 counties declared for individual assistance as of yesterday, October 11th. The Florida, Florida Manufactured Housing Association says of the 822,000 mobile and manufactured homes in the state, almost two thirds were built before 1994 when HUD made the code updates I referenced earlier. Prior to the storm, Florida was already one of the least affordable places to live in our nation. And so if you're a regular listener to this webinar series, you already know losing more of the state's affordable housing stock will have a significant impact on the ability of people to recover. Okay, all right, that's enough for me. So let's go to the next slide and introduce our speakers. So it, it is now my honor to introduce our speakers and I'm looking forward to, inf to the informa information they will share with us. First is Clint Tweetball. It's, he is the founder and executive director of Matthew 25 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Clint's background includes community organizing, asset-based community development and pastoral work. Matthew 25 focuses on holistic revitalization of economically marginalized communities and has helped the Cedar Rapids community recover from two of the largest disasters in Iowa's history by doing re rehabilitation work of more than 700 homes. Dr. Chris Smith from Headwaters Economics is an applied researcher with expertise in public finance, natural resources, and rural economic development. As part of Headwaters Economics' floodwise community assistant assistance team, Chris works with local governments and technical experts to help communities reduce flood risk. Shantaria Charleston oversees the Housing Assistance Council's Training and Technical Assistance Division. This includes managing their capacity building programs, such as the Housing and Urban Development Rural Capacity Building Program, Veterans Rehabilitation and Modification Programs, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Community Development Initiative. Shantari is also a recent appointee to the USDA's newly established Equity Commission Subcommittee on Rural Community Economic Development. Welcome to each of you, and thank you for taking the time to share your expertise 
Uh, let's go to the next slide. And, and Shantaria, I, I want to start with you. Why is manufactured housing such an important affordable housing option in rural areas? And how are these homes financed? Thanks, John. Thanks so much for uh, the great lead in and also level setting the conversation. Um, so we know that in general, there's a lack of affordable housing options, whether it be urban or rural. We can surmise that the housing stock in rural places is far more limited and significantly older. Um, this coupled with the lack of economies and commerce in rural places uh, results in lower incomes for rural families and residents which oftentimes don't allow for them to support higher housing costs. And so given these limitations, um, mobile or modular homes, if you would, um, for as much as they are maligned, they represent an important source of housing for millions of Americans with low incomes, most prevalent in rural places. Um, there are far fewer um, housing development activities springing up in rural places. Really here, there, there is the issue of scale. So larger developers or, or developments they, they, they don't come into, into small rural places um, just because there must be an upside for them. Smaller projects, they simply just don't pencil out for larger developers, um, which is where the Housing Assistance Council and other like agencies engage in activities that support rural housing and community and economic development activities. Many nonprofit housing developers depend largely on federal, state, and local funds and grants um, and two, they often utilize some of their own unrestricted um, assets to support the, the housing needs. So pretty much um, nonprofits in these spaces and responding, especially to housing challenges, disasters, they're pretty much operating on a, on a bootstrap concept. So specific to the financing of mobile homes, um, they are financed and titled very similar to automobiles and considered personal um, property. In many cases, not all, um, mobile homes are without permanent foundations, meaning they're not physically and permanently um, attached to the land. So in these instances, um, many are in home parks, not owned by the homeowner. They're financed with higher cost um, loans, typically called chattel loans, which have shorter terms and higher interest rates than traditional mortgages and two, fewer consumer protections. And so even when the owner of the unit owns the underlying land, financing um, still costs more than conventionally stick-built home financing. I wanna also briefly mention um, lot rents that John, you reflected on earlier. In, in some areas, there are investors um, buying up mobile home parks wholesale and increasing the lot rents. Um, and and this, this is something, and I think John, you highlighted it very well. It, it lends back to the issues of challenges with affordability and, and, and families being cost burdened. So mobile homes, manufactured homes are very important um, part of, have, of, of providing um, affordable housing options. Thank you for that uh, explanation. I think you, you went full circle in it and, and I can just imagine the nightmares associated with the financing. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that, but let me uh, go to Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, what has your research revealed about mobile homes and natural hazards risks? Yeah, uh, thanks, John. Uh, this is a really great question. Um, and I want to start off by just saying one of the things that makes my work at Headwaters a little unique is I have a foot working on the research and I also have a foot in communities. So you're going to hear me kind of bop back and forth between those worlds. Um, and I say that because a lot of our mobile home uh, work and research really has its origins and some technical assistance that we're providing uh, to a really small community in Eastern Montana called Glendive. Um, so I'll get back to that. So um, I just, this big picture of when I think about mobile home residents, I usually talk about them as facing layers of vulnerabilities that compound upon each other. So I'm gonna talk about physical, social, and split ownership, but I'll start with the physical. And this really had, um, this is really where our community work with Glendive started. So this is a community where it's very reliant on mobile homes and mobile home parks. And two of them in particular have super high flood risk. Um, we would expect a major flood if it occurs to inundate the mobile home park with something like 10 feet of water. Um, and because of the nature of the flood, it would be an ice jam flood. Um, there would be little to no warning. So a pretty extreme flood risk in this particular community. Um, 
And realizing that and talking with folks on the grounds, um, it also made us ask a bigger question at Headwaters, like how, how many mobile homes in the United States actually have flood risk? Um, and it sounds like a very simple question, but it's very challenging to answer because of the lack of data. And so as a side note here, I, I just wanna point out that the data issue is huge. Um, when we don't have data, we don't understand the magnitude of the problem. And then it doesn't, it's hard to create a solution or a policy to help because you don't understand what the problem actually is. So this lack of data, I think is one of the reasons why um, mobile home residents are, are often kind of invisible or not on the, the radar of folks. Anyway, so the map that you're looking on at on this slide um, is the result of some research we did at the national scale to identify all of the different census tracts that have both high levels of mobile homes and also high flood risk. So anything in blue is a place that we would say has pretty high concern for mobile homes. When you look at the dark blue areas, those are where the problem is most acute. So these are places that not only have high flood risk, but more than 25% of the housing stock is a mobile home. And so nationally, um, about five and a half percent of our houses in this country are mobile homes. So when you're talking about a neighborhood with 25% mobile homes, that's very high. Um, and when you add in the flood risk, um, it's a pretty, pretty scary situation potentially. So overall, our research found that one in seven mobile homes is located in an area with high flood risk. And that's compared to one in 10 for all other housing types. Um, so big picture, what we're seeing in this research is that mobile homes really are disproportionately exposed to flood risk. Wow, thank you for that uh, overview. And this, this picture is worth a thousand words. And, and of course, it doesn't get into all the other risk factors that people in mobile homes are, are facing. Uh, and I, I probably want to come back to that. But let, let's get Clint involved. Uh, Clint. Your community was heavily affected by a derecho in 2020. Can you describe the impact of that event, uh, particularly the impact on affordable housing? Sure, thanks, John, that's a great question. So August 20th of 2020, um, I was out for a walk and uh, it was just another day in Cedar Rapids um, and there was nothing on the radar, nothing predicted uh, other than a few thunderstorms, but nothing like what we experienced um, as I was walking back to my place of employment, all of a sudden the winds picked up and you could just feel that this was something different than we'd ever experienced. And so I started running and uh, ran back, got to the building just as kind of the heavens unleashed. Um, and it was, it was similar to a category three uh, hurricane, uh, 110 mile per hour winds, a lot of uh, gusts up to 140 miles per hour and it traveled from eastern, from western Iowa, really all the way through Chicago, and um, in the midst of that, uh, it brought all kinds of devastation. Cedar Rapids was kind of the epicenter in terms of the wind ferocity. Um, in Cedar Rapids, we don't have oceans or that kind of thing, but what we do have are lots of trees that we're super proud of. We've been considered a tree city for decades. Um, we have a lot of older residences that have large oak trees around them. Um, so when this combination of rain and wind hit, as you can imagine, it was, it hit hardest in areas that had the oldest homes. And often those homes um, are the ones that are least uh, built for wind events. They're the ones that the, are the oldest, maybe haven't been the best maintained. And so uh, when this derecho happened, we lost about 60% of our tree canopy. So trees were falling, pulling down power lines, falling on houses. Uh, most of our streets were impassable. And um, like I said, about 90% of our housing was impacted. The, the affordable housing was probably the most impacted for a lot of different reasons, chief among those being uh, the wind and the trees that were falling. falling. But then there were also things, um, those 
those windows are not built with the same structure around them that they would be today in older homes. Um, the a lot of the doors are not built in the same way. There are chimneys that uh, haven't had mortar put back into them for 20, 30 years. And so a lot of those fell on roofs. Um, and as with most things, the most impacted were the lowest income residents that didn't have the same level of insurance for their properties, um, that didn't have the same reserves. And so it's been really, really challenging for a lot of homeowners. Um, let, 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 me, uh, let me ask you a follow-up. First, first, I'm going to give you bonus points for explaining what a derecho is, actually, for those who have never heard of, heard of that. But I'm looking at the slide that's on the screen, and, and, and yeah. I want to ask you, um, how is Matthew 25 specifically uh, uh, re uh, supporting recovery for mobile home residents? Yeah, so quickly we discovered that mobile home residents, um, as you can see on the slides, were among the most vulnerable, especially those parks that were older, smaller parks um, that were built kind of in and amongst the trees. Uh, the, this mobile home park was called Edgewood Forest because it was in the middle of a forest, had lots of trees. And um, we quickly found that the vast majority of people were being rejected by FEMA um, for a variety of reasons. And so they weren't getting those resources um, when you have a large scale event like this that impacts 90% of houses, the contractors tend to go to the wealthier homes, the places where they know that they're going to get paid and where they're going to make the most money. And so we realized that uh, there was just kind of this gap in services going to mobile home parks. Mobile home parks are often tucked out of the way. The residents are kind of forgotten about. Um, and so... Matthew 25 worked with a variety of other nonprofit organizations in Cedar Rapids to develop what's called the PATCH program, providing assistance to community homeowners. And we created this kind of seamless system where people had one number that they could call for aid, one intake that they had to go through, and then those handoffs happened seamlessly from organization to organization, from assessment all the way through our role, which was construction management. And so as the ones managing construction, um, we were able to bundle lots of projects together. So that increased the interest of contractors because they knew that they were gonna go in and they were gonna work on multiple sites right next to each other. They also knew that uh, we were going to be the ones paying the bills. And so there was no worry about whether they were gonna be paid or not. Um, we also worked kind of as that quasi social worker and contractor with the residents to make sure that they knew what was coming, that they were prepared, had their space moved out of, or had items moved out into a storage pod so that construction could happen fairly quickly. So all of that, um, really helped to move mobile home owner owners forward more quickly with recovery than they otherwise would have. Yeah, I'm viewing these pictures and it's reminding me of my work, my time, uh, not just in North Carolina, but across uh, the South and in rural places. And uh, I, I often say that these places are forgotten, but but you, you you make the point, they're not really forgotten, they're they're, they're ignored for the most part. And, and Shantari, I wanna come back to you because I, I, I got a sense that you, you will touch on some of this, that you, you have something to say about it. So let me ask you a question. Uh, before you explain why manufactured housing is an important affordable option in rural areas, now, now tell us about the nonprofit organizations you work with and your efforts to strengthen their capacity to, to be a safety net in these kinds of cases. Right, no, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, lots of things that uh, Clint said sort of resonated with the work that we're doing with nonprofits and rural spaces. But specific to the work that the Housing Assistance Council does, um, we actually use a uh, multi pronged approach in our work with nonprofits, specific to strengthening the capacity of rural um, nonprofit housing developers to perform against the challenges in their communities. It often includes um, two approaches or two activities, I'll say. Um, 
lending and technical assistance and training. So relevant to this particular conversation, um, HACS uh, financing of manufactured or mobile home communities has been to resident owned communities where residents, they form cooperatives to purchase the underlying land, um, creating a resident controlled and governed interaction and ensuring long-term um, affordability. HAC has been doing um, this engagement through Rock USA, which is an organization created to scale residential um, ownership of manufactured home communities and provide long-term technical assistance on ownership and management um, to the resident owners. The second approach um, that uh, we that I, I mentioned um, is through technical assistance, that direct engagement uh, with uh, the rural nonprofits. Many of the nonprofits we work with, um, they are using mobile homes in response to natural disasters, or they had been historically. But here recently, because of the higher cost um, and limited availability of traditional building materials that coupled with the lack of skilled um, construction labor and the inability to move materials rapidly, um, there is a renewed interest in need. Uh, so much of the technical assistance we are providing is in specifically preparedness. So in, in doing this, um, it's really about planning for resiliency, which can include the basics of having an emergency roster or backup um, of equipment in an out of town area, not in the immediate area to, you know, for location of tools and equipment that would be needed to respond. Um, partnership creation to perhaps co-locate operations if a nonprofit's building is damaged or inoperable for, for one reason or another. I think the larger goal of any technical assistance as it relates to strengthening capacity around disasters is in the upfront work with preparedness. So I think I heard both uh, Chris and Clint say disasters happen out of nowhere. I think we can all agree on that. And so the best way to ensure resiliency for communities is through a planned response and coordinated efforts. And so I, I say that, you know, it sounds easy, but none of that happens without an advanced investment of time and resources. And so with that outlook, um, the Housing Assistance Council, we've created the Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery Toolkit. We call it the BCDR Toolkit. And it actually provides a planning roadmap for the most common um, situations. And then to some um, situations that are not ordinary that often goes unaddressed around other mission activities. And so that's kind of the way that we um, provide capacity building assistance to rural nonprofit groups. I could say more, but I'll stop there and just hold off for questions if there are any. Well, we'll, we'll come back to questions at the end. And, and you said a lot there. My, my friends will tell you, they often hear me say that it's very hard to be thoughtful and forward thinking in the midst of a crisis. That's why preparedness <laughs> playing is key. And, and you mentioned a word, the word engagement, which reminds me, uh, Chris, uh, in planning for this webinar uh, with the, the CDP team, you mentioned the challenge of community en engagement. Uh, please describe this challenge and, and, and why engagement is so important. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, community engagement is always really challenging. It sounds easy, but in practice it's challenging. Um, so to answer this question, I wanna go to kind of the second layer of vulnerability that I, I usually think about with mobile home, and home residents, and that's around social vulnerabilities. Um, we know that mobile homes are providing really critical affordable housing to some of our country's most vulnerable populations. And we also know from you know, decades of practice and also research that people with these vulnerabilities have really unique needs. And so community engagement has to be more customized. It has to be deeper and more personal. Um, so I just, I wanna give out some data um, just so we're all on kind of the same page about who we're talking about with mobile home residents. And of, of course, it's um, this is at the national scale. We know that mobile home residents um, tend to have higher rates of poverty and lower incomes. In general, median annual household income for a mobile home resident is half that of a you know, site-built home. And on a related, but like a little bit different note, um, we also know that mobile home residents have um, less median assets than your traditional homeowners. So when you think about things like generational wealth and what your safety net is, um, mobile home residents have something like 45,000 in assets compared to over 200,000 for a, a non-mobile home homeowner. Beyond that, 
we know that mobile home residents are more likely to have English as a second language and more likely to have a disability or mobility issue, all really important things to think about if you're making evacuation plans. We also know that mobile home residents are more likely to be seniors or to have small children. So all in all, all of these characteristics have been shown in the research to make people more vulnerable, not just to the disasters themselves, but also to the lasting impacts from disasters. And I'm just gonna shout out to all your colleagues, John at Texas A&M, because they're really leading a lot of research in this area, along with folks at CU Boulder and Arizona State and other places. Um, we have very good research that shows mobile home residents are more likely to be displaced after disaster and also a lot um, are more likely to have a hard time accessing uh, recovery resources. Okay, so just to back up and actually answer your question, why does this all matter for community engagement? Um, we just know that mobile home residents are being left out of the conversation, both out of the community planning conversations and also hazard planning. Um, and given what I just said about the folks who live in mobile homes, these are just the type of people that probably don't have disposable time or income to attend community meetings. So we have to really make a concerted effort to include them in our conversations. Um, this has been really true in my work in Glendive, just to bounce back to the community level. We've had a hard time reaching folks. Um, I'm actually leaving tomorrow to do a, some kind of direct engagement with people where we're literally just going to stand outside the mobile home park and give out free coffee and donuts and ask some really basic questions because we don't even have data on how many people live in that mobile home park. So we're going to be asking things like, how long have you lived here? How well do you know your neighbors? Um, would you need help if we had to evacuate you because of a flood? And so all in all, I just wanna say it's really, really important to specifically target mobile home residents, both with our community engagement and also with our programs because they very likely have unique needs. Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, you, you know, we could probably do another entire webinar just on the principles in, of engagement. I'm, I'm literally in rural East Texas today facilitating some co community planning events, but we'll, we'll save it for another time. Uh, as we cross the halfway mark, uh, I, I want to drill down a little bit. L let me come back to you, Clint, uh, and uh, just drawing on your experiences working with funders, what suggestions do you have for those interested in investing in mobile homes as a disaster recovery strategy? Yeah, well, I appreciate the way Chris and everyone else has highlighted that this is a group that often gets overlooked or ignored. And so I think it is really important that Funders think about this a little bit differently, maybe, than they do some of the other investments that they make. First, I think it's important to realize that this is a unique community. You know, the way in which uh, mobile home parks are built, the land ownership, all of that makes it just a really unique situation. They're often handed down from family to family or from friend to friend. And so it's important to be flexible in the rules that you set up um, as you're thinking about funding these. Second, um, like I said, we're doing construction work, but we're also doing social work, right? And I think that is even more true in mobile home parks than in other recovery I've participated in. And so it's important that you have those wraparound services and that you be willing to fund those. It's always most uh, appealing, it seems, to fund bricks and mortar, but uh, funding the other things is important too. Third, I think this whole idea of uh, return on investment, you know, that mobile homes maybe aren't as long lasting as site built homes, but um, the community that people live in and the way in which they support each other through good and bad in mobile home parks is really unique. In a lot of these uh, parks that we're in, there are people that have lived there for multiple generations and um, they need that support during a time of disaster. So just saying, oh, well, we've got better housing options, so why don't we go put you in something else is, is not as good of an answer as it might seem. Um, work with, get, with nonprofits that are really doing that community engagement that are getting to know park management because park management has a huge role in how people will be treated. You don't want to invest a lot of money and then have park management using a disaster as a way to kind of get rid of the most vulnerable or low income people in their park, even after you've invested. And uh, finally, 
you know, you're going to go in and you're going to find that it's really hard in mobile home parks to figure out where disaster ends and where maintenance issues that were there long before um, start. So I would encourage places to think about this as, you know, while you're in there helping with disaster recovery, if there are other health and safety issues, it would be good to go ahead and get those fixed as well and see your funding as helping with that rather than really trying to narrowly focus it on disaster. Thank you for, for, for that. I, I mean, I love all of this talk about uh, uh, safety nets and, and weaving and maintaining the fabric of community. Um, Shantaria, ch chime in here. Uh, what do you think is needed from funders to support disaster preparedness for communities with manufactured homes? Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, I'll go back to my earlier comment. Um, none of the necessary work in preparation happens without an advanced investment in time and resources. Communities need agencies on the ground um, that they know and trust to have the capacity, human and financial, to perform against the challenges in their community. So if you, if you think about what it looks like after a disaster, um, families are often left, in, in some cases, with nothing, no identification beyond what's in their wallet that was on their person at the time of, a, of the disaster, if they are lucky. Community agencies can assist residents with obtaining and electronically storing those important documents that become necessary to receive FEMA or other state emergency assistance. So my very clear answer is that nonprofit, the housing developers and other adjacent service providers, they need support and resources for staff um, that are dedicated specifically to this activity in part or in whole. I'll give you an example. And I think this goes back to a comment that Clint just made. There are, if, if a family can't qualify for FEMA due to lack of you know, the proper paperwork, Federal programs, some federal programs will not allow emergency repair. Even if a, a, a particular community has the funds to invest, they will not, the regulations will not allow for emergency repair. You have to bring the entire unit up to code, and that includes the health and safety standards that, that Clint addressed earlier. The one thing about philanthropic money um, that's really important and critical and helpful is that it allows communities, nonprofit housing and service agencies to actually go in, see what the greatest need is, and then respond in a timely fashion. Thank, thank you, uh, Shantaria. In, in a moment, uh, we will transition to our question and answer section. Uh, and remember, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to add your questions for our speakers. And we are uh, so far on track, but I, but I have one last question for Chris. Uh, before we open up for audience discussion. Chris, given the, the barriers mobile home residents often face to accessing help, the things that Shantaria and Clint just talked about, what advice can you add to uh, for funders seeking to address gaps in assistance so mobile home residents are not overlooked? Yeah, I want to just kind of talk about that third layer of vulnerability that I think we've all been talking about, um, and that's around split ownership. So this isn't every mobile home resident, but about 40% of mobile home residents own their mobile home, but rent the land. So you can think of this as a classic person living in a mobile home park. This puts them in a really awkward gray space where they are both homeowner and renter. And yet when it comes to many assistance and recovery programs, they are neither homeowner or renter and they fall through the cracks. There's a ton of examples. I mean, Clint's talked about some of these examples with FEMA. Um, we could go on and on. A really obvious one is just from the COVID Recovery Act that, um, that we had in 2020. A lot of mobile home residents didn't qualify either for mortgage payment relief or for the moratorium on evictions. Um, and I've I thought I would just give some of the, um, an overview of some of the work that I've been doing in Glendive and what's been challenging about some of that work. Um, it's likely, or it's a possibility, I should say, that a couple of the mobile home parks we deal with, with the most extreme flood risk might need to be bought out. And of course, there's federal money available for commercial property, um, but that money goes to the owner of the mobile home park. And there's actually not resources for the residents who would have to be moved, who would be displaced. 
Um, and that puts the community in a really awkward and kind of a lose-lose situation where they have to decide, would they rather you know, force people to move and get them out even though there's no assistance to help them find new homes? Or do you let them keep living in a neighborhood that has really extreme flood risk? And again, there's no, for many states and at the federal level, there's just not support to help communities deal with these really tough situations. And of course, with climate change, we expect that to get worse. Um, so there are some pretty substantial funding gaps. Um, on the recovery side, we have seen private organizations and nonprofits like Clint's do some really wonderful work helping people stay in their homes, even when the cost of repairs is more than what the house is actually worth. And that's a really critical strategy and solution. At Headwaters, we've been bat um, batting around kind of different ideas for how could we help mobile home residents before disaster occurs. I wanna go back to something that Shantira said at the beginning around um, community ownership and helping the residents of mobile home parks actually purchase their park so they have control over decisions and they can invest in resilience me measures. Um, there are many nonprofits doing this work and it's really exciting and important. I think um, some of the other solutions we talk around are programs that would specifically target mobile home residents. And that could be through relocation assistance or helping to replace these older mobile homes that we have noted aren't really great. Um, we know there are better mobile homes available. Many people just can't afford them. Um, energy efficiency upgrades. The idea would be to have programs that actually are designed for mobile home residents because they often don't qualify or they fit awkwardly within other programs. And the last thing I'll point out or suggest and that we've been thinking around a lot is just creating programs and strategies where you engage directly with mobile home residents and helping communities collect data on their mobile home residents. You know, these are our neighbors. They are critical members of our workforce and they have been overlooked. Um, so it's definitely time that we do a better job including them in, in our community planning and in our hazard planning. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I hope the things that uh, our speakers have offered today have uh, been a form of enlightenment for the for the listeners and hopefully spark their imagination as to some promising strategies that they might test out in the places uh, they work. So uh, now let's hear from the audience. Um, and I'm looking at the question and answer box and looks like there are a couple of questions coming in. Uh, we received some questions in advance to kick things off. And we'll work through those as the uh, uh, other questions start to land in the question and answer box. Uh, but let me just note, please, please remember, CDP webinars are aimed at providing education for the philanthropic community. So while we welcome questions for all, we want to prioritize those addressing funder issues. I just wanted to make a note of that. So uh, just a question from my own curiosity. Um, Clint, ha have you observed any differences in the nature of recovery after a flood versus a derecho event? Yeah, it's really interesting. There's there's good and bad aspects of that, right? Um, on one level, you could say that uh, there's somewhat quicker recovery with uh, derecho than there is with flood because you don't get into as many policy arguments over where you should or shouldn't rebuild. Um, you don't have to wait quite as long for funding in some ways. Um, the flip side of that though, is that when you have an event that impacts 90% of households in such a wide geographic area, just the overwhelmingness um, that it takes on, on contractors uh, makes it so it's really challenging for people with few resources to move things forward. So even me with all of the connections that I have, you know, two and a half years later, I'm still, in the midst of derecho recovery work just because contractors have been busy. Um, and always when contractors are busy, that means they're gonna go, go to where they can get paid the easily, the easiest and the most first. And so that's really been where we see the biggest impact is it feels like um, people that are the most vulnerable have been hit even harder by the derecho than they were by the flood. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, for the first question, I, I want to. I think this one is for for Chris, and it picks up on what you were just talking about. Uh, is from Maggie. Have the systems 
problems or policies for people in split ownership situations been discussed with FEMA as part of revisions of policies in light of disaster equity? For example, a number of FEMA, FEMA individual assistance policy changes were rolled out last year that had been worked on for a while. So, so is, is this on FEMA's radar, things you discussed? Yeah, and maybe I can also answer some of um, Aaron's question about state um, and federal policies in this please, one. Please do. Yeah, there there is movement on this. Um, I you know I think more needs to be done. I'm not sure how much FEMA is going to change some of their individual assistance programs, and maybe the other panelists can jump in if they know. Um, the problem with a lot of this is around the benefit cost analysis. And it's getting back to Clint's um, point, which is when you get a mobile home that's damaged in you know, some kind of storm or disaster, the damages are often very extensive. And we know that mobile homes tend to depreciate so that the value of the home might only be a few thousand dollars. The repairs might actually be you know, many magnitudes higher than that. And there are very few federal or state programs that will take on that, that cost. And I'll also say, I think we also hear a lot of private funders not really wanting to you know, spend money on homes that might not be seen as worth it. Um, so that is a big challenge for these mobile home residents. And I've talked to a lot of private funders who say, well, we're making investment in mobile home parks, knowing that um, you know, another disaster might come along and destroy it again. And it's a huge risk. Um, and that's a tough, that can be a tough bill to swallow. The other thing I would just say um, on the state policy level, we see a lot of, um, we do see some movement at the states and Aaron highlighted Vermont. I would consider Vermont to be a real leader in helping mobile homes. Um, after Irene, they had a lot of mobile home parks get damaged um, significantly. And since then, they've done a really great job creating an entire statewide database of mobile home parks that includes things like flood risk and also like when their rents got raised last. Um, and then in addition, they are now, they have a specific fund that helps make up the gap. So if, if FEMA is not gonna cover a project, this state fund can come in and pay for the costs and there's no local match required. So we're seeing some mobile home buyouts occur in Vermont using that funding. And I believe the funding originated from COVID relief funds, um, but now it's also including like ongoing general support. So that model to me is really promising and exciting and something I really hope we see more of. How about Shantaria or, or Clint? Do you have any response to Aaron's question? No, John, unfortunately not. We, we don't, um, in, in terms of training and technical assistance, we, we don't work on that level. I can actually push that question up to our policy team and perhaps uh, send that back to you, John, so that you can respond. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't seen any changes that have happened. Um, I know that there have been conversations and some changes on FEMA, but not on CWG funding and other things that are long-term funding streams for housing. Um, so, unfortunately. Okay, I'm uh, scrolling through the questions and, and looking for one here that I can maybe restate. Let's... Um, let, let's try, uh, there's a question from an anonymous attendee that's asking about land banking being used in conjunction with recovery and use of mobile homes. Um, any of our speakers uh, have thoughts on that? Examples or um, stories or lessons of land banking? John and Shantari, I'll just quickly jump in and say that the work that we do with um, nonprofit housing developers because a lot of the, the funding that they receive is federal and other state funds. Land banking is a disallowed activity. And so um, specific to the, the nonprofit or the community um, based organizations, not we've not seen that. Okay, I'm uh, <clears throat> pardon me, going through the list. Uh, and I've got a question for Andrew. Uh, from Andrew. Uh, mobile, his question is, mobile manufactured home insurance policies rarely pay enough benefits to cover repairs, replacements of the units due to depreciation and overall poor quality of the policies. 
United policyholders is working with Fannie Mae to improve options for mobile manufactured homeowners to ensure their assets. Are there any panelists aware of innovation and in group coverage plans? That, that uh, sounds like a no. And uh, okay, well, let's uh, let's let's. Let's find another question here. All right. Let's see. I've got a question from Craig. Uh, is there federal financial assistance to help a developer buy out a mobile home community, build safe and affordable housing, and then offer that housing at affordable rental rates to existing mobile homeowner residents? Anyone, I'm not directing that at, at anyone that said. Uh, John, I can, I can answer that. I think, um, I think there are probably really interesting ways to stitch together multiple funding sources for a project like that is honestly the kind of thing that we would like to do in Glendive. Um, but I don't know of a specific one funding source that you could do all of that, but I think you could probably stitch it together. And I think that to me is some of the challenges for this type of work is that you can be really creative um, thinking through how to help mobile home, part, mobile home residents in general. But some of these big solutions um, just take a lot of work to, you know, A, make sure that the mobile home residents have buy-in and are on board with the solution you're proposing. And, and it, feels good to them. And then also finding the funding is very challenging. Um, and I want to just point out um, Jeff's comment, because I think it's important that it sounds like there are different, different things that are happening in Louisiana about replacement programs. And I do think it's important to know different states approach this differently. And so there are, there are definitely places doing it better than others. And it's uh, great to hear that in Louisiana, it's working better. Um, that's not true across the country. And so there's a lot of uneven, unevenness across the country in this space as well. Okay, I, I wanna take just, just one more question before we wrap up. There's one from Brian that I think is uh, directed at Chris. And the question is, has the research by Headwaters uncovered an estimate of how many mobile homes might be on tribal lands? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we have new data coming on board around our tribal boundaries. Um, so I think I could get you that number. I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, those boundaries are kind of contested. So just being aware that it's not as easy as it sounds to get that data. Um, I think it's a really important question. And we know that there are, are a lot of mobile homes on indigenous areas. So Brian, if you email me, I'm happy to dig a little bit deeper, um, but I definitely wanna, wanna keep thinking about that. Okay, the question started to roll in here in the last uh, minute or so, and I, I, I'm afraid we won't be able to get to them, but I want folks who are sending in questions to know that we see you, and, I, and I've got a message for you uh, in, in closing. But but let me just take uh, a couple minutes to um, um, uh, provide the audience with a couple of summary thoughts and actionable items from our, from our conversation. Uh, do we have a slide for that? Okay. Um, just a couple of summary thoughts. First, remember that manufactured homes face high exposure to natural hazards. As we have heard today, people living in these structures have higher exposure to wind and tornadoes, hurricanes, extreme heat, wildfires, and uh, other types of uh, events compared to those in, type, in other types of housing. Second, prioritize manufactured housing in recovery and preparedness, preparedness planning. These homes constitute a significant portion of affordable housing for many communities across the country, particularly in rural areas. Ensuring these structures are accounted for in planning will help mitigate the risk facing a critical part of our community's housing stock. Finally, provide fun funding and support beyond the check. Funding for re rebuilding, replacement of older homes, preparing uh, of older homes, preparedness, risk mitigation and strengthening organizational capacity are needed, of course. In addition to uh, financial capital, though, uh, donors can invest time in community engagement, uh, demonstrate trust in partners, and help make connections among stakeholders. Uh, that, that's the kind of social, moral, and reputational capital that Ambassador James Joseph, the uh, former C CEO of the Council on Foundations, wrote about. Um, next slide. 
So uh, in addition to all the things we discussed today, you can find many other helpful resources and lessons uh, on the CDP website at disasterphilanthropy.org. There are issue insights which provide an introductory look at disaster responses. Disaster profiles provide regular information about the impact of disasters and the needs of communities to inform philanthropy on how they can help. The Disaster Philanthropy Playbook is now hosted on the main site and provides numerous resources for those planning disaster funding. There is a monthly newsletter full of information and regular blogs, uh, including a weekly what are we what we're watching blog that highlights disasters around the around the world. And uh, CDP's uh, team is always available for general guidance. And, and if you need more in-depth assistance, they offer a, a range of consulting services. Again, the website is disasterphilanthropy.org. And uh, let's talk about upcoming events. Next slide. Please join us on November 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern for our next webinar, State of Disaster Philanthropy 2022, COVID-19 and beyond. Okay, let's uh, wrap now. All right, so uh, yeah, in order to respect everyone's time and to keep uh, this to an hour, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you to our co-sponsors and to Clint, Chris, and Chanteria for taking the time to share their insights with us. And please, all three of you, please accept my invitation on LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> don't for, for, for our audience, uh, don't forget to take a moment to complete our post-webinar survey uh, to let us know what you liked and what you would like to see in future webinars. It'll pop up automatically when you exit this webinar. Okay, and so for those of you who uh, submitted questions that we couldn't get to, my apologies to you. Uh, if your questions or thoughts were not addressed during today's webinar, you may email them to my friend Tanya at tanya.gulliver-garcia at disasterphilanthropy.org. Uh, luckily, her email address is on the screen so that I don't have to garble it again. Uh, thank you all and have a great afternoon.